Hi everyone. I'm John Loheis. I'm the Vice Chair of Communities in Bloom and we are so excited to bring you another webinar in our 2020 virtual symposium presentation today. Today we are excited to learn more about the St. Thomas Elevated Park. Uh, not only does the states have one in the, in, in the New York High Line, we've got our own version. So before we start our webinar today, we'd like to thank all our Communities in Bloom sponsors and partners at this time for their contribution towards our 2020 special edition. Their support and the support of our registered communities is truly appreciated. Today's webinar is sponsored by our longtime sponsor from the outset of CIB, the National Capital Commission. So thanks very much to the NCC for their support of our program this year. And we have a slide now showing the NCC. As well, we have a short video to share today with a message on behalf of our sponsor. Every day, we work to build an inspiring capital that is a source of pride for all Canadians. Before I introduce today's speaker, please feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A feature throughout this presentation, and we'll do our best to address all the questions. You can find the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. If you don't see it right now, you may just need to hover your mouse around the bottom of the Zoom screen to have it pop up again. And what I'll be doing is monitoring the chat feature. Uh, we'd like, we'll collect the chat questions and then at the end of the presentation, we'll field the questions uh, from our speaker. So now I'd like to welcome our speaker today, Serge Lavoie. With a background in journalism and small business, Serge has had a 35-year career managing a total of eight trade and professional associations, most recently as president of the Southwest Economic Alliance, as well as president and CEO of the Canadian Plastics Industry Association. Born in Quebec City, raised in London, Ontario, with stints in Sarnia and Toronto, Serge now lives in St. Thomas, where he has served on numerous boards and committees relating to heritage preservation. He is founder and project lead for the St. Thomas Elevated Park, a 10-year labor of love. And you have to almost question, uh, did the High Line come first or did the uh, St. Thomas venture come second? Anyway, Serge will thank you for joining us today and we look forward to your presentation and Serge, now it's in your hands. Well, thank you, John. And to answer your question, the uh, high line definitely came first. So I'm going to share my screen here and I'm assuming it all works. Yes, okay. So here we are at the entrance to the St. Thomas Elevated Park, uh, which has officially been open just three years, still under construction, um, although it's been 10 years in the making. Um, I want to concentrate today on how this project came about, how a community of 40,000 people were, was able to do something like this, uh, and perhaps share some ideas on how similar, uh, not identical, but similar projects could be done in any community across the country. Um, I'm going to talk uh, on three themes quite often. One is grand vision. You've got to have a grand vision. I'm also going to talk about opportunism, not the negative type, but the type that uh, allows you to be flexible in your planning and execution to take advantage of uh, opportunities as they come along. And then community engagement. All three of those 
were critical to the success of the elevated park to date. This is uh, the location of the elevated park before the railroad came to town and the, the community was a sleepy hamlet of 3,000 people, mostly agricultural. The uh, railway came to town in 1871. This uh, is still the location of the bridge today, but it's the first of three bridges made of wood and it was about 1,300 feet long. Uh, by the end of construction, the community's population has shot up to over 5,000 from 3,000. Uh, on less than 10 years later, the wooden one is replaced by steel, and by now the community is uh, at 11,000. So the railroad came to town was St. Thomas's version of the Yukon Gold Rush. And yet another 20 years later, there was a need to make the bridge even bigger and better, and this particular uh, steel and concrete uh, version was built in 1929, uh, all built in Walkerville, which is in Windsor, uh, and then shipped by rail to the site. Uh, it was an engineering marvel of its day. Um, however, all good things come to an end, and while this was and has always been a railway city, uh, this was the last train in 2005, a tourist train, number nine, uh, uh, engine, which is uh, used to be housed here in St. Thomas and is now elsewhere in Ontario. And this is the scene in 2010 when CN, the last owner, uh, pulled up the rails. What we were faced with was this, uh, a rather squalid-looking uh, in, in industrial site just on the edge of town in the most historical part of our community over a beautiful, large uh, Kettle Creek Valley, uh, which is part of the, uh, made by the last ice age. It's quite a spectacular area. We, we knew we had to do something to save this bridge. Um, and being a, a, a community that uh, uh, loves its rail heritage, uh, we had to find some way to repurpose it. This, um, this picture told me three things early on. Um, it told me that uh, when you're on the bridge, it very much looks like you're just standing in the treetops looking at the environment, even though at this point you're 100 feet over the valley floor. The other thing it told me is that the sunsets up there are spectacular. And that's important because you frankly want something to attract people uh, to something like a walking trail uh, over the valley floor. And the third and probably most important thing this, this picture told me was that stuff will grow on this bridge. The construction of it, and it's a unique construction, is essentially like a series of long pools or ponds that hold gravel, but will also hold water. And without trying anything at all, lots of stuff grows. So it, it told us that we had the possibility of doing something pretty interesting up there. Now, we were aware that there were uh, walking trails across old rail bridges all over Canada. Uh, here's an example in Goderidge on the left, another one in St. Mary's on the right. Um, they're narrow bridges. Ours, of course, is much wider. Uh, but we saw the potential of doing simply a walking trail over uh, our river valley. Uh, we ran across unique examples around the U.S. This is uh, in Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts. It's an old trolley line uh, across the river. It's a mill town, and it's quite a charming-looking thing. And uh, I became aware that thousands of people were visiting it every year for horticultural reasons. Uh, I ran across a uh, boulevard planté or promenade planté in Paris, which is the very first of the elevated parks in the world. Uh, and being in Paris, as, in, as you imagine, it's quite charming and beautiful. Um, a very simple structure uh, in the Bastille area of uh, Paris. And of course, the uh, daddy of them all, the High Line in New York, which was just a concept in the early 2000s, uh, but became very quickly uh, upon construction, the, uh, the most popular tourist attraction in Manhattan. It exceeds visitors to the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty. Um, so we certainly knew that people would be attracted to something like this. However, we're not Manhattan, we're not Paris. Our bridge is on the edge of a community of 40,000 people and it's located at the cusp of 
uh, the urban part of our community uh, and the uh, rural part of our community. So we had to be realistic about what it was we could do. Uh, we thought we certainly could do a park uh, with the width at 30 feet and the length at 855 feet. Uh, you could certainly do interesting things up there. And we, uh, we actually got ourselves a trillion grant to do a, uh, a master plan. Peter J. Smith out of, uh, Saint, uh, of uh, uh, Niagara Falls, Ontario, did the master plan and gave us a variety of ideas of what could work. They also gave us a $7 million price tag, which we knew that our community uh, would never be able to do. So we had to do a little more thinking. Uh, we reached out to the community. We said, we have some ideas. We need to buy this bridge. Uh, we need your help. And sight unseen, without any ideas on the table, the community gave us enough money to buy the bridge and the associated land. It was $65,000. Um, we also uh, decided to buy extra land, an additional three and a half kilometers to the west of the bridge so that we could potentially line up to future rail trails uh, outside our community. So again, $65,000. Uh, with no particular promise of something going up there. We came up with a concept. There's the, uh, the, the Bear Bridge on the left, and on the right we came up with an artist concept of how our little hanging gardens of Babylon could look. We uh, wanted it to be a people place, so we didn't want it just to be a place where you walked across, but we wanted stuff happening up there. So again, our, our vision showed that. The very first thing we did before we did any construction is that we took a donation of a sculpture by a local artist named Scott McKay. This particular sculpture is known as Fear Not the Wind, and it's a working weather vane. Nothing existed on the bridge at, the bridge at, the push at this time, but uh, when we uh, got his generous offer, because he's a fifth generation a resident of uh, St. Thomas, and his family wanted to give back to the community. As you can see in the bottom uh, right picture, there was nothing to really see, but it got people curious. It got people talking. What is going on up there? And we were able to use this opportunity, that word opportunism again, we were able to use that opportunity to get the community conversation started about a bridge that could be turned into a park. People could see the sculpture, but only from below. There was no way to get to it. Since then, that particular sculpture, by the way, has become our most iconic piece. We have many attractions up on the bridge, but this one has become iconic. And if you look on Google and on Facebook, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of pictures of it that people have taken over the years. We took a, a measured approach to our site. Um, on the right is the approach from town. Uh, anybody who knows anything about St. Thomas knows that we're the site of the famous Jumbo sculpture. This is where the most famous elephant in the world met his demise in 1885. Um, we're only half a block from his commemorative sculpture. So already thousands of people come to that part of town every year. So we wanted people to experience the elevated park even before they got to the bridge. So we've got essentially 300 meters of approach on the east end of town. We've got another 300 meters of bridge, and then we've got three and a half kilometers of general trail to the west. And we thought about planning each one of those separately. We set ourselves some basic uh, rules. The most important rule was we didn't want to block the linear views. Uh, this aerial shows that very clearly. We always wanted to remind ourselves and people that this was a rail line. It was a rail line from 1871 on. We also didn't want to leave any, take anything away from the site. That was really important for practical reasons. If we were to start taking things away from the site, we would likely run afoul of environmental assessment rules. So everything on site stayed on site, and then we could work within our own property no motorized vehicles of any sort, and it had to be fully accessible for all mobility needs. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that the trails were natural. The, the idea here is that we, we recognize that when the railroad came to town in 1871, it, it 
basically put a gash through what was a beautiful natural site. Our vision was that we would let the site renaturalize itself, uh, simply editing it along the way to ensure accessibility and, and uh, safety. And finally, we wanted to make sure that uh, everything was robust, steel, stone, concrete, uh, wood. Uh, we wanted to go for safety and we wanted to be as light on the environment as possible, so introducing only gentle lighting, uh, in our case, bollard lighting. Um, before we could even touch the bridge, because we knew that was the most expensive part of our project, we started on the approach from the east, and we created this iconic entrance, uh, we created a ramp, and we started placing art on the site to attract people. We uh, immediately forged a partnership with our local uh, St. Thomas District Horticultural Society. Uh, we've got them, of course, all across Canada. Ours is unique in that it, it was established in 1871, the very same year that the railroad came to town. So they have a special affinity for the elevated park and the railroad. And they actually have projects in other parts of town that tie into railway assets. But in, in very few short days, they were able to take uh, a gash uh, at the opening where we created a ramp for access. They were able to turn that into a rather spectacular rock garden. This is what it looked like just one year later. So nature took over. Half of what you see there was introduced, half came back naturally. Uh, the soil uh, samples on that, by the way, showed that half the soil was cinders from the old steam days. So it was not a pretty site to work with, and yet nature took over. When we created the approach to the bridge, we had, again, a very large gash in the, in the, uh, uh, in the site. Uh, we didn't take anything away, so all the old rail uh, ballast, the, the gravel was pushed to the sides. We put down a bed of chip and dust uh, for uh, accessibility. And one year later, this is what it looked like. Nature took care of that pretty quickly. That's a very gentle, natural site. When you're there, you'll run across deer, you'll run across all sorts of critters. Even though there are houses to the north side, uh, they are screened off by the trees uh, and by the berms that we created. We uh, introduced a lot of stuff. We are in the Carolinian zone uh, for uh, agriculture, for uh, horticulture, so we're able to grow things there that you wouldn't ordinarily find, such as this prickly pear cactus. Uh, we take full advantage of the fact that we're in the Carolinian zone. We want to create uh, a, a special place for people to enjoy when they come to the, the park. It's, it's got to meet a, a variety of needs. People who love nature, people who are rail enthusiasts, people who love history, they're all going to find something when they get here. Uh, but very early on, the focus was on nature. Our friends at the Horticultural Society came up not only with the rock garden at the beginning, but they came up with another concept called the Stumpery Garden. And some of you may be aware of it, uh, the world's largest stumpery garden is actually owned by Prince Charles at his home, Hargraves, in, uh, in the UK. And there's a lovely tie into uh, uh, railway history here because stumpery gardens began as uh, a response to the fact that when the railroads were going through England, tearing up the landscape, there were trees and stumps everywhere littering the landscape and the great estates found a use for them. They created a new form of gardening called the Stumpery Garden. And we started going out looking for stumps. People thought we were crazy. You got any stumps you can give us? Got any old wood you can give us? And we incorporated that into the landscape, and it's now part of the look and feel of the elevator park. This is a little hobbit house. It's a, it's a uh, hollow stump that we put into place. We planted it, and every year something new comes up in there. And the porthole that you're seeing there, the old knot hole, is at uh, the height of about a four-year-old. So they just love going by there and looking at it. And many, many pictures have taken of this. We uh, let a lot of weeds grow. We, we, we take out stuff that is clearly invasive. Uh, the middle one, of course, uh, is very invasive. Uh, but we've left it there as a nod to the fact that our part of southwestern Ontario has a lot of Scots. And this, of course, this, this was introduced from Scotland. 
We, uh, we're not ashamed of letting nature take over. Goldenrod, a lot of people say, oh my God, I can't handle it with my allergies. But frankly, it's a beautiful part of what we've created and we let everything come back. Uh, we're also on a flyway for raptors at this time of the year. And so this photo was just taken last week. Someone was uh, lucked into doing a cell phone picture of a hawk who didn't seem at all concerned about that person being so close. We're also on the monarch flyway. So at a certain time of the year, we're inundated with hundreds and hundreds of monarchs that fly through. And uh, our neighbors, the, uh, the, uh, the farms in the area, they've supplied us with the odd thing that is kind of charming. So this is a, an old tractor. And when they said, oh, we'll clear that out of the way for you, we said, you know what, leave it there. And it, again, it's one of those iconic things that is photographed like you wouldn't believe. We added some features that were kind of unique. Uh, this uh, live edge uh, maple bench uh, was uh, paid for by a local knitting shop that is just down the, uh, the road from where we are. It's a knitter's bench. And then uh, a local group put up the little free lending library right beside it. And it was, it was actually built by uh, students at Fanshawe College. Uh, and people bring books and take books away. And it's there all winter long, all summer long, and we've had no problems with it at all. Uh, it's one of those little surprises that people find when they get there. While we, now we get to the bridge itself, and uh, the bottom part shows you a schematic of what uh, the, the bridge looks like and all its various piers. There are 15 concrete piers at different heights, the highest one being about 105 feet. And the top part shows you how we've broken the bridge into a series of zones or rooms. Uh, from the east, uh, we start with a boardwalk, and then we get into a green zone, a play zone, a soon-to-happen next year a water zone, and then finally boardwalk again. And that off at the end is the uh, western trail. This shows you from a height what that looks like. And this is roughly what it looks like today. This aerial was taken just a few uh, days ago. Uh, so on the right, you've got the boardwalk. On the left, you've got uh, the white part you can see is sidewalk, and the grayer part is um, gravel. But starting tomorrow, we are actually putting in uh, sod. So by the end of the week, all of that area that is gravel will be covered in sod, and we'll have something approximating a, a live roof. And that'll be pretty exciting. It's a test. Uh, we don't know whether that's going to be feasible or not. You'll notice on the bottom left, there's a creek running through there. Uh, we do have permission to do water taking from that. And one of the plans is to actually uh, create a pond on top of the park, uh, just over the creek, where we can pump water in and then uh, pump it on through an irrigation system that should keep the grass alive. We'll see about that. But uh, we're willing to take risks. Uh, one of the things that happened after the first piece of art was donated is that we immediately got donations of other pieces of art. And we, uh, again, in an opportunistic way, never say no. So uh, we currently have six pieces of art up there uh, in various stages of installation. Um, all of them designed uh, locally or by people who grew up locally. Uh, and it, the art itself has become a major reason for people to visit the park. Uh, so add to uh, the list of interested people, art lovers. We get lots of people coming up and we have plans for even more art coming up. This is what the boardwalk walk looks like uh, looking east. It's a rather serene place. place. Uh, they managed to take this photo when there was only one person on it. Um, but as you can see, uh, there's a harsh difference between the deck which is about 200 feet long, and the approach behind it. Um, so you find a lot of those really strong contrasts all the way through. This is the deck looking towards the west. And you can see we've uh, put in a couple of trees. We actually have seven more trees uh, going up next week uh, in planters that are already in place. Uh, and then there's our iconic piece of art. We also, uh, through the Kinsman Club, put up a sunshade. It's pretty sunny up there in the summer. Uh, but the minute, the minute we put up the sunshade, uh, people got the idea it would make a great band shell. 
So in one of our public events up there, uh, we turned it into a band shell and let people um, sit around it. And that's now part of our plan for the future is to uh, program the band shell. Right next to the band shell, just this year, we put in the Rotary Music Garden. It's custom designed musical instruments made by a local uh, uh, blacksmith artist, uh, all tuned. Uh, one is pentatonic scale and one is the regular eight uh, note scale. And of course, we're, we're putting in some gentle low features for kids to play on. We can't get into swings and teeter totters given we're 100 feet up, uh, but we can do low level things like this. Uh, we're putting in balance beams, we're, we're painting uh, games on the sidewalk, hopscotch, stuff like that. So there's an area for kids to enjoy themselves. Um, we don't leave the bridge open at night for safety reasons at the moment. Our lighting will not uh, be active until the end of this month, uh, or end of October. Uh, but uh, we have done special evenings. This case, it was a, a star watching evening. Uh, where we uh, uh, bring generators up and create a little bit of lighting and let people experience the site at night. Uh, it's a very beautiful place at night. This is a northern piece sculpture uh, that was sitting at Ontario Place uh, over one winter as part of a competition. The artist is a local and she donated it to us and then reestablished it on the, uh, on the bridge. It's actually called The Far Away Nearby. It's a series of seven pillars uh, with a lighted plexiglass lantern on top. And it works surprisingly well in our linear environment. At Ontario Place, it was up against uh, Lake Ontario and was interacting uh, with the lake. I want to really talk about the importance of community engagement. Uh, our, our community has been everything to us. Uh, we've had all sorts of people go up there trying to find reasons to use the park. We've had several music videos done up there. Sarah Smith is there on the left. Uh, she shot a video there even before our construction was done. Um, we've had other videos done up there, some of them impromptu, some with our permission. Um, but we have really tapped the community, not only for money, but we've tapped the community for work. That, that 6,000 square foot boardwalk was built with uh, a donation of $25,000 worth of lumber from the local home hardware. And then it was put together by volunteers eight, ranging in age from 12 to 80. Uh, people coming out every single day during last summer, putting our boardwalk together. We planted trees. Uh, this is with the TD Friends of the Environment. Uh, we have sold shares in the bridge, if you will, and uh, then we mark uh, their involvement uh, with plaques either on the railings or on the benches. Uh, corporations get larger signs because uh, we've had donations upwards of $100,000, uh, all community-based businesses. And we even get donations from people who just visit the park. We've created this rather um, steampunk-looking donation box. Uh, it's at our front entrance. This is the third the previous two were broken into. Um, we, we, we also have people who love hanging out at the park for all sorts of other reasons. So this particular box uh, has not been broken into. It's, uh, it's put together like a Chinese puzzle. So even if you manage to cut one piece of it, you can't get into the box. Um, but surprisingly, this is averaging 35 to $40 a day for us uh, right now. Uh, so Historically, we've been able to pay our insurance solely by the coins that go into this box, which is significant. Uh, so it's an important thing for us, and it's an important way for people to feel like they're doing their part. But beside this, we also have a sign with a QR code leading you to a, an online donation uh, by credit card. So we're really a people place. Um, we've really tried to engage the community. It's a free site. It's always going to be free, but consider this, we're a not-for-profit corporation owning a public park, paying taxes and paying for insurance and not charging an admission. So that's a really interesting business case, as you can imagine. Uh, we count on people being engaged with us. If the minute they stop engaging with us, 
um, we probably will find it difficult to meet our, our, uh, our goals. We've uh, done an annual picnic up there where 275 people will pay $50 a head to, for the privilege of going up on the bridge and having uh, a long picnic table running along three or 400 feet up there. Um, last year, after the de deck was done, a farm-to-table organization uh, did a $100 a head dinner, uh, all farm-to-field foods or field-to-table uh, field foods. Uh, and uh, we had a good turnout for that as well. It's the first time we served alcohol up there. We thought, hmm, that could be an interesting one. Uh, but it turned out just fine. It was a lovely evening. Uh, our local community, our, our, you know, our Economic Development Corporation, our Chamber of Commerce, our Downtown Association, they support us every way they can. Recently, they, they did a whole uh, series of billboards around town promoting tourism and promoting uh, public engagement, and we featured uh, strongly in that. Um, so it's really been a community event, and that's been a critical part of what we do. We've also engaged, we've tried to fit ourselves into a much larger picture. And uh, just last year, with the support of uh, the Trans-Canada Trail uh, group, uh, we managed to reroute the Trans-Canada Trail through our three and a half kilometers of uh, open trail land, uh, as well as across the bridge and then down into town. The Trans-Canada Trail um, for a long time did run along the rail line, uh, but when CN pulled out, they pulled out the rights to a trail, and the trail had to be moved uh, to the roads themselves, which made for a, a not very pleasant part of the Trans-Canada Trail. Uh, now the Trans-Canada Trail, uh, with their financial support as well, uh, is giving people a four-kilometer section of walk that is tied to the rail history of this community, uh, which is an important thing for us. We're not finished with enhancements yet, uh, we've just uh, concluded a partnership uh, with our local public arts center, which has a, a large collection of about 2,500 pieces of uh, art, some of it local, some of it, most of it Canadian. Um, and with a grant from a local um, bequest, um, an estate, uh, we will be putting up a series of art reproductions on the bridge as well as on the trail. And the whole program is known as a, a Art uh, Trees and Trails. The same uh, bequest is allowing us to plant full caliper trees along our uh, trail. So we are now not just having a three and a half kilometer trail, but we are uh, instituting something called the Arboretum Line. We've had members of our Naturalist Association um, doing an inventory of the trail uh, recently. Uh, we have a lot of Carolinian stuff that's gone in but they're in there looking at every single species that's grown. It's all native. There are a few interlopers, but not many. And our plan is over the coming years to plant hundreds of full-size trees, uh, label them all and create a walking tour for people who want to see the best of the Carolinian forest. You'll expect to see all sorts of trees up here, hickories, copper beech, everything you can think of. Um, secretly located. We're not telling anybody where they are right now, but we have three thriving pawpaw trees. Pawpaws uh, will grow readily here. They are, uh, we are in the very top end of their native uh, area. Pawpaw trees have a really important connection to our history because they are tied into the Underground Railroad, and we found evidence of an Underground Railroad uh, gospel church having been located right below the bridge on that creek. So again, another tie to our local history. So the Arboretum line is going to give people uh, another facet of the experience. Uh, and uh, uh, with this, we're tied in with uh, the folks at Fanshawe College who will be doing the, uh, uh, the geolocating. They'll also be doing the app for us. Uh, the naturalists are doing the inventory. Um, and it will make that three and a half kilometer walk through the countryside, that's much more interesting and unique, frankly. I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the larger vision. This was a rail line, remember, that came along in 1871, and its prime purpose was to connect Buffalo to Detroit. 
southwestern Ontario was the quick way to get through. And so the, the, the line was known as the Canada Southern uh, Railroad. And Canada Southern uh, was owned by Americans, and it was a way for them to, to get goods and people essentially from Chicago to New York City through the fast route. And that, that created kind of a unique situation for us in southwest Ontario because this route um, was much more direct than the route that went further north uh, up through Port Huron. This is the route uh, where uh, people who took a train from Chicago to New York would stop off in St. Thomas halfway through and uh, to have a bite to eat or what have you. And so you had the likes of Bob Hope and Lucille Ball and Count Basie and all sorts of people came through St. Thomas and uh, we got to know them and they got to know us. It was a very interesting situation. So we have an opportunity here and this is where the vision comes in. We have an opportunity to look at a rail trail that goes from St. Thomas all the way to Windsor. The rail line still exists. The rails are gone. Uh, we have a vision, and one of the reasons why we bought more than just a bridge is that we want to see this trail continue on through Elgin County, uh, on into Chatham-Kent, and ultimately through Essex County to the Detroit River. Uh, Chatham-Kent is already in the process of converting its uh, part of the rail line into trails. Uh, we've done our part. We are, we've given ourselves the challenge of trying to bridge the gap between St. Thomas and the end of Elgin County um, by converting this into a rail trail. That's going to require some form of public-private partnership. Um, our top-tier uh, government, Elgin County, looked at the possibility and decided uh, to pass on the opportunity in the same way that the city of St. Thomas decided to pass on the opportunity to buy the bridge back in 2010. Uh, so the vision is still there. People see the value of it. Even Elgin County, I think, sees the value of it. Uh, however, they're concerned about uh, liability issues and cost. They uh, believe that uh, this line will cost about $8 million within El Elgin County. We believe it can be done for under $2 million. Um, in the same way that uh, when we first took our management plan it, and we were told it would cost $7 million to do the elevated park, we set ourselves the challenge to do it for less. And I can tell you that today, so far, even with the improvements we're putting in this year, we have not hit a million dollars yet. So we've been able to do an awful lot with good old fashioned sweat equity from the community donations of all kinds, um, and looking for less expensive ways to bring delight uh, and interest to, uh, to the attraction. Uh, it doesn't always have to cost a lot of money. Insurance is not cheap, I'll give you that. But we do have this vision that uh, the Canada Southern Rail Trail could definitely happen within the next year to two, and the larger vision going through Chatham, Kent, and Essex County. So um, I've, I've got a new job for myself for the next couple of years. I think uh, what's really important is that uh, we were able to blow through a lot of public pushback on this project uh, from the early days by getting people to see their community differently. In the very early days, people said, uh, all well and good to talk about you know, the High Line in New York and so on and so forth, but this is St. Thomas. You can't make it happen here. And besides, who wants to go up on an old rail bridge? They're going to go up once, and that'll be the end of it. So what's the point? And we had to show them that there was a reason why people would want to go up there. Um, and we've been proven right. We've been open to the public only three years, and we've been making improvements every year. Only last year did we open the bridge end-to-end. -end. Up until then, you could only go on for the first 25% uh, uh, of it. But we now routinely on a weekend especially, get thousands of visitors, people walking dogs, people riding their bicycles. Uh, I can't tell you how many wheelchairs are going across there. It's just fascinating. So I think we have managed to show people that even though it's not New York and even though it's not Paris, um, there is a reason to believe that people will want to come to an elevated park 
in little old St. Thomas, Ontario. It's visually exciting. It's a place to call your own um, any time of the year. So I'd, 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 I'd really like to open it up to questions. Uh, there's a way to reach us. You can find much more about our story on our website, elevatedpark.ca. You can find daily updates on what's going on at our Facebook uh, page, St. Thomas Elevated Park. Uh, and you can certainly reach out to me directly with questions uh, at admin at elevatedpark.ca. Uh, just to brag a little bit more, even though the Ha Nine exists out there, if you Google Elevated Park, nothing else, just Google Elevated Park, you will be taken to us before you're taken to the High Line. We, have, we, we own the concept of the Elevated Park, and I'm very excited about that. Um, we didn't have to do anything special to get ourselves to the top of the Google search terms. Uh, tens of thousands of visitors during the life of our project so far uh, have made us uh, well-known uh, across Canada uh, into the U.S. And actually, just a few weeks ago, I got a, an inquiry out of Norway. Uh, it's quite remarkable the kind of, of profile we've been able to build with a very small amount of money and a whole lot of community engagement and thinking big. So, John, I might turn it over to you. Okay. Would you like me to keep this? Would you like me to keep the screen on, or do you want me to go to uh, face? Uh, we'd like to see more of you. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, yes, here I come. Fine. Here I come. Okay, great, Serge. Uh, tremendous. Uh, you know, um, I think you've embodied some of the concepts that Communities in Bloom uh, uses, both provincially and very small communities in between, large communities, across to Europe, uh, who we have on on uh, our webinars. And you've really hit on something that uh, I think is core to Communities in Bloom, and that is valuing what is in your community, understanding your resources, building pride in your community, and understanding all of the elements. And we have a, a grid, of course, that recognizes uh, plants and trees and culture and uh, natural heritage and all of the things you've mentioned. I do have a couple questions from people, so I'd like to uh, take the time to, to do this now. One of the questions were, is it possible that you could use uh, succulents uh, instead of uh, like sedum instead of uh, sod on the bridge, which might reduce your need for water? Uh, it is possible, but quite frankly, we wanted to create a lawn. We wanted people to be able to lounge on the lawn and have picnics. Just a couple of weeks ago when we were doing some work up there, uh, the, the gravel was being pulled up preparatory for the, uh, for the grass. And uh, a couple of mothers and uh, their kids in tow brought a blanket, laid it down on the deck right at the edge of the construction. And the kids were watching the construction for uh, probably a good hour, hour and a half. We, we see the value of a lawn up there. Uh, it's a cool space in what is... Uh, um, could be a very hot environment. So we think that we can cool it down. We, we're planning to overseed the sod with more uh, hardy uh, versions. This year turned out not to be a very good year for buying sod. Uh, COVID really uh, cut down on the availability of a variety of sods that we might have wanted to go to. Um, so uh, we will be making some tweaks, but frankly, our vision is being able to sit on the grass, have a picnic, and listen to the music in the sun shelter. And you use this term cool space. It's not only just cool in terms of temperature, but cool as in a great place to be. And that's uh, placemaking, which I'll talk about in a few minutes because we have the next seminar all about placemaking. Um, yeah, and one of, another question that came forward was, how do you recruit volunteers? Well, they've been finding us uh, from the early days. We worked with a very small board of about 10 people at the beginning. We're now down to a core group of five, uh, but we have working groups. Um, we, I guess we farm it out is, is the quick answer to that. The Horticultural Society finds its own volunteers, and they do work days up there every couple of weeks. Um, we put the all call out through our Facebook page, and we, we can't keep up with the demand. Um, People 
routinely. Uh, my, my phone number is on the website and on the Facebook. Uh, I've made myself very available, and I get uh, uh, calls at every opportune, inopportune moment you can think of, people wanting to engage with the park somehow. So uh, we've never had a problem of finding volunteers. Uh, but we spend a lot of time uh, putting out a lot of information about the grand vision. We think out loud. This, is, this has really been an important part of the process. We, we, we don't plan in the background and then just say, look, look what we've just done. We plan it out. We're thinking about this. We're thinking about that. What do you think of this idea? What do you think of that idea? Every incremental little change, we promote the heck out of it on our Facebook page and on social media generally. So people have been coming along with us for this 10-year ride. There are people who remember the early days. Um, as if it was yesterday. So we brought them on this ride for a long time and they feel a part of it. And so when we put an all call out for some work to be done, we have no problems getting people. Well, I, I remember uh, cycling uh, through St. Thomas on the, uh, the great, great uh, trail, uh, the cycling trail that's along Lake Erie and looking up at that bridge, a hundred feet up is, a, a, you don't think of that being a, a, a high number, but that's really tall. And uh, congratulations to you and the entire community for understanding what this could be. And uh, we uh, have no, uh, we're running to the end of our time. So uh, Serge, I, I'd like to uh, thank you for your contribution uh, to, to the effort here. And I have a few more comments to make uh, now that uh, we're completed this particular part of the, uh, the webinar. We hope our participants today will be joining in for more of our virtual symposium sessions that run Wednesdays and Thursdays over the next two weeks with a final town hall session on Friday, October 9th. Uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern today, uh, just a few minutes, we'll have our next session titled Placemaking in Communities in Bloom. And uh, it'll take some of the principles I think that Serge outlined here today very well. So you have a few minutes to grab a coffee. We hope to see you there. And please be reminded that each webinar has a separate Zoom link to join. So you'll need to leave this webinar, log out, and then log in, uh, re-register into the next seminar with the information that you've had. And thanks to Serge for a tremendous presentation. And uh, it shows what can be done with a vision and persistence. Thank you all.